the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many of you are comfortable with Jesus sitting in judgment on you? Separating the sheep from the goats. Telling you these things that last for eternity. You like this part of Jesus? How many? <laughs> We've got a few. A few brave people. How many of you are afraid you might be a goat? Oh, a few hands. Okay, we got a couple. How many of you are hopeful that you are a sheep? Well, don't worry. You're all in trouble. <laughs> and that's how it goes. This reading we have from Matthew comes immediately before Jesus heads into his crucifixion. It's right before the Passion. And we have here a story of responsibility, what it takes to be a child of God. And we're called the brothers and sisters of his family. We all belong to his family. And woe be it on anybody in the world who is not good to his family. So we have to sit and listen a little bit to what is surprising about this reading. It has very little to do with judgment. It's silly, isn't it? Because it has judging all through it. But it has very little to do with judgment. It has to do with catching you by surprise. So let's look and see where the surprises are. And it should be a little surprising where they are. He tells the people on his right, and let's say that is Jesus on the throne up there, and you all happen to be in, on the right of Jesus. He tells you all that you fail to see him. That's where you're getting the judgment. You failed to see Jesus. You accept responsibility that you fed the hungry and that you clothed the naked. You, you did your good prison visits and you went to visit parishioners at home. You gave food. You, you gave of yourself. So there's no argument there. You're good sheep. You're following your shepherd. But you fail to see Jesus. And it says that you all reply, when did we fail to see you? We did all those things. Right? But you didn't look into the eyes of suffering. Because if you don't look into the eyes of suffering and confront suffering at the most intimate level, you're not seeing Jesus. You didn't see Jesus. We tend to say our prayers looking up to God. I know I do. And I love this mosaic. I love coming in here and letting my eyes just rest on him up there. I feel safe. I feel included. But we're told, do not look for me up there. Like I told the kids. You go out and find the neediest member of this community. Someone who is forsaken and unloved. And look that person in the eye and minister to them, and you will be ministering to me. Now goats, you're on the left side of Jesus up there. The goats are not defending the fact that they didn't do any good works. They admit they didn't do anything good. They knew that they didn't go to the hospitals. They knew that they didn't pull out food from their pantries, and the best food, I might add. They knew that they didn't do works of mercy. There's no argument about that. They're proud of being goats. Right? But they said, when did we not see you? How, how did we miss you? Because if we'd seen the king coming with all of his glory, Lord of lords, king of kings, we would have done anything to help you so that we could be thought of a little higher. Right? We want God to think a little higher of us. So of course we would have waited on you hand and foot, dear Lord, king of kings, and giver of gifts. Give me a gift. They're not saying that they didn't do the work, the work that they didn't do. They didn't do the work. But they're saying we're surprised that we could have seen you in those people. They're surprised. So this is what we need to ponder on. That we have a God that is already sitting at the right hand of God. We believe that. But we're told not to look for him there. We're to go out and find somebody that looks a lot like Stephen Hawking instance. How many of you have been following the story of his life and have some of his books? This absolutely brilliant mind in a body that's shriveled up and looks rather tortured and he speaks through a device that's not a voice, it's a mechanical sound. And it's hard to look at him in the eyes. 
But that's where we're supposed to look for Jesus. If you want to go to a prison and see the people on death row and have some intimate contact with them, that's where you find Jesus. And that should make us uncomfortable. We're not very comfortable. Or go find a homeless people at Grand Central Station rummaging through the trash. I saw one on my way home last week. He was going through that trash like it was nobody's business. He obviously did it a lot, and he knew what he was looking for. But did I go up and interrupt him and get some eye contact with him? I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> That's not what we're supposed to do. But we're supposed to see the, the things that come to us naturally. In your daily life, when you have the opportunity to be of service, don't just give with one hand while you're on your cell phone with the other. You know what I'm talking about. We have to give our whole self to the ministry that we're called to. We are not comfortable with a Jesus that is humble and hurting. And that is why when Jesus was raised up on the cross, his friends had deserted him. That's not the game plan that they were rooting for. They wanted him to be royal and take care of them. And we all want that. But he had to be up there as the most needy person in Jerusalem that day. And that just juxtaposed in a clashing way with the hope that we have for our Savior. It is the disgrace of the cross. And we don't like it. It's just a disjunct. It doesn't work. And we have to force ourselves into that place. That place where we want things to be taken care of and we have to confront the ugly in this life. <clears throat> it isn't easy, but this is what we're given to do as we head into Advent, to think about what we expect in the second coming. And this is where these readings take us, is that we're looking for the time when we all will be welcome to come to God. And in Matthew's version of this story, unlike any of the other versions, everybody on this planet is invited. All people come to him. It starts with the wise people coming from all nations to go worship at the baby Jesus' manger. And this story ends with all nations being invited. Everyone. The word is ethne, or ethne. Ethne, this is your word. <laughs> ethne means all people. It means all people. All Jews. All Hindus. All jihadists, all people, all the homeless, all the bereft, all the lonely, everyone is invited. Everybody who does mercy is part of the kingdom. It doesn't say everybody who loves Jesus. It just says everybody who does mercy is acting towards the love of Jesus Christ. So this is part of the Bible that we should be a little uncomfortable with. It's not grace that gives us this. It's our own work, putting ourselves where our prayer lives lead us, and then knowing that grace will be there. It's just not mentioned in this reading, but we know grace will be there to help us be able to discern the people that need our love, and to know that we are not loved any less for making ridiculous mistakes and being ashamed of what we do. We're still loved. We have the opportunity to always turn and come back. And that's in Matthew where eternity lies. Eternity doesn't lie in being in the outer darkness forever and ever. Eternity lies in that beautiful, pregnant moment when we recognize Jesus in the most downtrodden of us. And we give thanks to be in the presence of greatness. And that is why we go minister to those who need help the most is we are in the presence of Christ when we're in their presence. And we can get ourselves out of the way and let grace do the work of creating the crown on Jesus Christ. We pray that we know how to get ourselves out of the way, and we pray that we are guided to who God would have us minister to, and recognize that in that opportunity, we can have some intimacy with our Lord. Amen.